what up y'all today we're going to be taking a look at this game called hell is us it's a game that's published by nikon and developed by rogue factor first before we get started what i want to do is i want to take a look at some of nikon's publishings right just so that we can have a good idea as the publisher and the quality of product that they like to send out and so far what i was able to gather is they're the ones responsible for test drive unlimited as well as the robocop game that came out that was pretty much praised by those that you know played the game as well as Blood Bowl 3 and The Session Skate Sim, which I heard from people was a, a pretty solid game. As for Rogue Factor, Rogue Factor, this is, I believe, their third game that they're developing. The previous two games that they developed were Mordheim. I probably just butchered that. City of the Damned. I've never played this game, but I have seen it on Steam a few times. The other one is Necromunda Under Hot under hive wars now i did see this one a little bit when i was getting into necromunda hired guns one take it with a grain of salt that was their previous two titles now how you look at that is how you would look at that but this is just a little bit of what i like to do whenever i'm researching a game to see if it might be something that i i'll be interested in back on to the hell is us main page right now they also have a gameplay reveal for the game so that's pretty good. We're going to take a look at that. But the other main thing is they have kind of a brief synopsis of what the game is or a premise, if you will. And it's if war is the closest we get to hell on earth, it's because hell harbors the worst of demons humankind in an isolated country ravaged by fratricidal conflict which i had to look up what fratricidal means it's the first time i've ever seen this word it basically means something that happens within a family or company in particular you know what cidal is just add that in investigate your past and uncover the secrets of a land full of mystery no quest markers map or compass will reveal points of interest to you here's what i took away from that for the most part is for those of you out there that played games like legend of zelda breath of the wild tears of the kingdom elden ring games of that particular ilk that plop you into the world leave you to your own devices what we're going to do next is we're going to take a look at the gameplay reveal trailer by sony it, it looks like it's being received very well by people i don't remember when it happened but I remember how I felt. Father told us to hide when they came to our house. Then, then they took him away. Mother said I couldn't play outside anymore. Everyone had fled. She said the country was sick. But we would be okay. Mother always said monsters didn't exist. I thought they lived under my bed. We were both wrong. They lived inside our heads. And I think right here, at least taking a good look at it, that's why I was thinking this game reminded me so much of Control because Control, like, it had the hiss. And the hiss was pretty much this um, this entity that existed within the world, but it also created all of these different type of geometrical shapes and all that that the player pretty much fought against. Or it even had like something that was like kind of glitched out, but it was sh shooting out like different squares that was in it. So I'm curious to see how they handle this, especially because this seems to be like a more so putrid representation of humans or human beings that have been disfigured and morphed into like this this crazy looking thing so I, i'm curious to see how they handle that okay. and see like right there all right, hold up. So if I go back, like right here, this is where it starts to remind me of control. Like as it's breaking out like that shape, that geometric shape that's kind of deformed, but layered as well with different shapes inside of it. That gives me like control vibes. That right there too. And I'm just saying control in terms of enemy design, not necessarily anything else outside of that. Now, I think the game itself might, it might control like a, bit unique just given how it looks as though it plays so i'm curious to see how they handle that that drone to the air to the come down was kind of dope I 
and I think that's the other thing too. my boy so here's the other thing that i was thinking as well i think most of the enemy types in the game just given from what they showed us granted it's an announcement trailer we're going to take a look at the gameplay trailer next where it's like about 14 minutes of gameplay we might not go into all of it but we're going to try to get through most of it for the most part to see what the game is really about what i've been meaning to say is i think that the enemies or the enemy types in this game are going to be variations of this particular arch type of enemy and they're just going to create more subtypes of it maybe give it more limbs or more joints so that it kind of looks a bit more disformed or disfigured there was kind of one that looked like it had four legs and it was moving around kind of like insect like a little bit with its limbs bent in like that so i'm, I'm curious to see how they gonna handle more of it let's go ahead and hop into the extended gameplay trailer hi everyone my name is jonathan jacques villatette i'm the creative director and the art director on hell is us i hope you enjoyed uh the trailer that you've seen recently uh today we're back in the spotlight we're going to show you a bit of gameplay a bit more than what you've seen in the trailer and i hope that you will enjoy this part greatly all right so let's start with the basics so hell is us is set to be released in 2025 it's for pretty much everything so xbox series x playstation 5 and uh pc so the game is a bit uh, of a take back to games from the 1990s. We're a team of passionate people. The average on the team is like 20 years of uh, development experience. So we're from a different generations and we have a lot of love for how the games in the 90s were made and how they were uh, played and experienced, especially the fact that I love the fact that he said that because that has been like my major gripe with most modern day game development is it feels like there's a lack of passion for the things that are being made and it feels as though everything is either template or there's some type of formula that there that they don't want to deviate from and try to experiment to see if there's a well of magic that they could possibly tap into to expand that game to, to make it more fun or the quote unquote ideal manner of fun or, or things like that and that main issue to me is it's just more so it's a culture thing it's is that a lot of people don't really understand how they were previously made and given that there's a bunch of new tech out there they're t they're using that tech and they think that that tech is just an easy mode to get to their goals faster which in a lot of cases it is but if you're you're constantly thinking like that it kind of stunts you from innovating a little bit because you think that you have everything that you need and so because you don't feel limited it doesn't necessarily breed that creativity out of you like how it did in the past it, i hope that makes sense uh you know there was no hand holding there was no silver plattering you kind of had to figure stuff out by yourself you were really in control of your exploration and, and i was all off with that he's talking more so about like the world of video games themselves i'm over here thinking about like the the, the, the creation culture of it he, he's like nah i'm just talking about like the the game design pattern <laughs> your own discoveries and this is what we're trying to do uh in hell is us obviously with modern flair and kind of like modern uh knowledge of, of game design and whatnot but very much puts you back in the driver's seat of your experience and of your exploration and then the result and the joy of your discoveries so hell is us takes place in a country called hadia hadia is in the grips of a uh, vicious civil war. You play the role of Remy. Remy is actually from Hadia. He was born there, but his mom smuggled him out at the age of five, like it sometimes happens in those countries. Uh, and what I mean by that is Hadia is a hermit state, is a turtle state, it's completely closed off on itself. Nobody goes out, nobody comes in. And that's why Remy's mom decided to smuggle him out so he can have a better life. He grew up in the foster home system or the foster system in Canada. He's always wanted to come back to Hadia. He wants to find his parents again. He wants to kind of like confront them. He's got a lot of questions for them. He understands why they abandon him. But yet, you know, uh, abandonment is pretty much the biggest trauma that a child can have. That is and true. There's like a loop that hasn't been closed properly for that him is towards true. this situation and his parents. When the game starts, Remy uh, has finally been able to infiltrate Hadia during the brutal uh, civil war that I was talking about. Remy is a ON peacekeeper. Uh, he quit his post. Uh, he went AWOL infiltrated the country and this is where the game starts remy remember
Okay, cool. So he right now it seems like he's just explaining the backstory of the main character for the most part which kind of explains why they had the combat prowess that they they exhibited in the trailer which was a lot of sword play a lot of combo techniques with the drone itself but i think at the same time it would be nice if a lot of these things could be two things shown that means a player's like remember two things the quote unquote it's that, extended uh, gameplay his village video. of birth was called Jova and his father was the blacksmith of Jova those are the only clues you begin the game with and these are the only clues that Remy also know so equipped with this knowledge with these clues you begin a game and you try to find your way to Jova you must be lost to wander around Sinedra forest I'm afraid. Okay, my bad, sir. That's three times I wasn't familiar with your game. <laughs> All right, so you was basically doing the setup for where you're currently at in the the, the extended gameplay. That that's my bad. My bad. I, I thought you was yapping. I'm yapping too. And I have very little to offer. A group of strange-looking soldiers arrived here last night in an APC. Take a look. So this is the investigation tab, which is what I'm assuming might be quest. Oh no, not quest. These are questions that you can ask, I'm guessing. Because this one say, Ernest Catwell, who are you? And this one is Village of Jova. Do you know where the Village of Jova is located? So yeah, these are things that I'm guessing dialogue options that you can select. So general knowledge is Hadia, Civil War, uh, Owen Peacekeepers, Sabinians. So I'm guessing if you have prior knowledge of this before you enter into this conversation you can gain this or maybe this is something that you can gain directly from the npc that you're currently talking to which that would be kind of dope if you could e. and perhaps you can ask them for help it's not the first time i've seen them they always seem to be snooping around here for something they parked their apc just beyond the woods to the north okay once in the woods, follow the wind chimes. They will lead the way through. Is he drinking milk? The gate to enter the woods is locked. Here, take this key to unlock it. Cadell. Okay, so let's talk about this uh, design philosophy that I've mentioned earlier, which is, uh, you know, I said the word silver plattering is something that I had been thinking about for, for quite a few years and uh, the team as well, which is if you look at modern day or contemporary adventure games and RPGs, uh, pretty much everything is given to you on a silver platter. What I mean by that is when you explore, everything appears in front of you, you know, you have He's talking about the uberfication, as I like to call it, of game design. Or how, how should I put it? When I went to GDC 2013, there was a game dev workshop that was being held. One in particular was about game design. And one of those things that was asked about game design in particular, and I think this was also asked at one of the GDCs that Phil Fish, Edmund McMullen, and Tommy Refines went to as well. If you don't know who each of those are, Phil Fish is the uh, creator of Fez, Tommy Refines and Ed McMullen are the creators of Super Meat Boy, or they were Team Meat, if I remember correctly, and they, they disbanded, they broke up. Where I went, there was a topic that was brought up about, about game design and how much information do you give the player. And one of those major things was that you don't want the player to be lost. You don't want them to not have what they need in order for them to succeed in the game. And while that's fine and dandy what it also does is or what it also illustrates is it, it shows that you don't have trust in the player to be able to figure things out and so as that evolved over the years and ubisoft is is one of the primary developers that do this you ever noticed how like before you actually get into a game you spend about a good hour or two and like tutorials learning how to walk around and all that even though you've played games in that series previously that's the reason Reason why they don't want you to get lost they don't want you to feel uncomfortable none of that while you're playing the game and it's understandable video games are meant to entertain but at the same time what it does is it steals valuable time from the player that they could be using actually playing the game actually learning things on their own because everybody is capable of learning i shouldn't say that so <laughs> so out there like that because there could be somebody out there that's not so in, in in this particular case what he's trying to say is he misses the era of video game where that wasn't a big thing and where i say ubisoft comes into play is or the uberfication of game design because everybody started to follow Ubisoft. 
there's the tower system for you to be able to reveal everything on the map or there's the go to this particular person and it will reveal everything in the area and then you could just go and do the different things or there's the all right you're now in the world and everything is available to you but we're going to give you all these icons that's going to visually disrupt what you're trying to do or to completely overwhelm you and in all of those instances those don't breed fun gameplay moments what it does is it gives you chores essentially it gives you a list of tasks to do that feel like chores and what he's trying to do is break that and separate it and make it feel like a game again i hope i explained that well <laughs> have your compass on top of you that's like a sixth sense like a magical sense that detects you know all the the caves and all the, the cool stuff around you and the towers and this and whatnot uh, it just appears magically and you have your map and you have your mini map and you have your quest markers and you have your objective markers and you can drop your own markers and and you have your quest journals and it just never ends and if you think about it uh, what happens with that is that you're not truly truly exploring you're just kind of like flying by wire and when you find something exactly. it's not really your discovery it was kind of handed to you exactly. on a silver platter so what you're looking at now is we're having a discussion with a bloke named Ernest Cadell. He's telling us certain information and then he tells us it's quite far. Uh, you need to itch a ride. Uh, you might find people that are willing to give you a ride. Uh, it's up to the north of my house, so you're going to have to use your compass, but your real compass, right? With the coordinates on it, north, south, east, west, blah, 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 and follow that. And he tells you that in the Lost Woods, in order to find your way out, just follow the wind chimes. He says, I've attached them there for my kids when they were young because they kept them getting lost in those bloody woods. And then he tells you, follow the sound of the wind chimes and you'll find your way on the other side of the woods. That's how we do it. It's very organic. It's very realistic. You know, someone in real life could have told you the exact same thing. So the environments, the visuals of the game are not just there to illustrate, they're there to communicate. So you need to play the game. You need to open your eyes. You need to open your ears to what NPCs tell you and you'll find your way and you'll discover things and you will truly own your discoveries and the great joy that comes with that. All right. And so, as he said, there are visual cues within the world to help you figure out your path right and a lot of modern games do this as well so i don't think he truly is doing anything unique with this game in that particular instance because games like assassin's creed which is and as i like to call them ubi fired game games like uh horizon forbidden west and horizon uh zero dawn those are also ubi fired games they use yellow markers in order to illustrate the straight a path that you could take um Games like Ghost of Tsushima also do something similar where they have more of a unique system in that aspect where it uses the wind to act as a guiding compass, kind of similar to the different, not necessarily bonfires, I forgot what they call them in Elden Ring, how each grace basically points to, bounces off of each other to let you know where your next point of interest is. So a lot of games have been taken and twisting that particular game design pattern into their own way or at least morphing it into their games and what he's basically just saying here is how our quest structure is is that when you go to a particular individual and you communicate with that person that person will then give you an idea as to what that visual cue is that you should be looking for as you're progressing through the game in this particular case you went and talked to the guy Ernest. The guy Ernest told you to look out for wind chimes. The wind chimes then guide you to the next point of interest that you need to go to. At least that is what I deciphered from that conversation. Now, I, as I said before, I don't think that is unique. I do think that is a good way. It's, a, it's always a good design pattern to visually tell the player what to do than to directly tell the player what to do, if that makes sense. It, 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 it helps with immersion. So I'm going to skip ahead real quick because I'm also noticing that like some of this other stuff he's going to explain is more so going to be about exploring different chasms and caverns and how all of that work. And for me, I would like to see that in the game, if you will. So what I want next is I want to go right here because it looks like it leads into combat. So by now, uh, you've seen a lot of what I guess is like exploration and looking around and talking to people and doing puzzles and all that kind of sweet stuff. But if you've seen the trailer, 
you of course notice that there's another big aspect to the game, which is third person melee combat. So we like to say that the game is 50% exploration and 50% combat. The game is not at all only about combat and it's definitely not at all just walking around and figuring stuff out. It's the combination of both. And we also think that the way that we've combined them is quite refreshing and quite unique in Hell Is Us. I will say this, given what I saw, um, just so far, I don't think y'all should do 50 50 but um it, it said alpha footage so that means that you're working on a beta or you're you're getting close to working on a beta at this point um you're at least out of pre-production and at the beginning of production but at least that's my assumption so if that is where you're out at i know it's probably too late to change a lot of things what i would say though is you probably would want just given what type of player base exists now and how a lot of players mostly play like they're still playing games from back in the early 20 teens or late 20 teens so what you want to do is you should make it 30 70 30 in the exploration and puzzle solving department 70 in the combat department but i understand 60 40 60 would work as well but i think it should be 30 70 because the combat system from what i've seen in the announcement trailer it looks good however it could be a case where it look it's actually terrible when you actually play it we don't know but in my mind it just makes sense to do that but if the story is as good as he said it is and most developers are going to tell you that they got the best. They got the cream of the crop. We got the best writers out here in the business. They're going to they're gonna find a way to try to sell you their game, you know? I'm just saying, bro, if the exploration portion of the game isn't really fun and it looks as though it's as slow as what I've seen here, people are going to check out. Now, I hope it speeds up. If it don't, people are going to check out. So like I said, combat is an integral part of the game. I do want to emphasize now that we're not a uh, Souls-like game. The game is a lot more mid-core. It's have fun, get in it, and uh, hack and slash. It doesn't mean it's easy. It's not overly hard. There's a learning curve, there's subtleties, there's little things that we've invented just for the, the flair and the flavor of Hell Is Us. It's very crunchy. I think the friction is pretty good and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. So there's a wide variety. Hold up, you know what's crazy about that? What's the name of that game? I got it on Xbox 360. What's the name of that joint? Too Human. It reminds me of Too Human from Xbox 360 back in the day. The way the combat scheme is. Y'all, y'all, y'all might have some. I ain't gonna lie. Y'all might have some with the combat. I gotta see more though. I think the friction is pretty good and uh, I hope that, you enjoy that it. That looks good. So and then you there's a wide right variety there. of enemies in the game. So we have kind of like the but more the drop common system enemy is kind of type, like that of a dark side walker, too, So it's these kind of humanoid bipedal white that. enemies that you can see here with the holes in their faces and their chests and whatnot. So obviously- Okay, so it is different variations. Uh, and there's quote, different unquote, types of them and different, like and different tiers of strength too. and powers yeah. but when you're facing pretty much the biggest threats in the game it's what we call like a dual entity so it's like hollow walker has a haze inside of it so it's when the haze is present i'm not going to get into the details right away of what the haze represents it's all part of the lore and what you will figure out in the game but when you're facing a combo of like these dual entities, and it can go to like three of them, four of them, there's the herders, there's the fervents and different types like that. But that's when you really need to master the combat system. That's when you start having to use all the tools and techniques at your disposal. The drone has tons of skills to upgrade it. And the drone is very much your little sidekick to help you I in fighting multiple like enemies system. at a time. He's not a sidekick in the sense where he talks nah, and he has an AI. Nah, He's very much a drone that has its own protocol to do this crowd management like during my the combat. Brain can't. So you have your different weapons Him you have point. olympic skills attack to weapons which is basically you can see this for magic even though in the game it's not considered magic it's kind of like a scientific base to them but that's when you really need to master all definitely the look like a the combat game, system bro. use all the tools in your arsenal and at your disposition and get in the melee with these kind of dual or triple or quadruple or not a nice con it looked kind of like a perfect world game. and uh be victorious so or like I mentioned, here specifically, you can see a combat against Olympic entity that has multiple hazes attached to the hollow walker. That's when it gets really complex. It gets very overwhelming because you're alone, but you got your trusty little cat. So you need to use 
its skill. So for example, Cappy has a skill where you can distract an entity, either a Haze or a Hollow Walker. Uh, you can use the Forward Charge, which is one of my favorite. You also have the Typhoon. You have the Super Dash skill, which is another one of my favorites, where you can start dashing sideways, forward, backwards, really, really fast. It gives you like this Japanese action game style. And then you also have your Olympic skill, so you need to find the glyphs in the game, and you need to attach them to your weapons. And this is when you start getting powers that come from these weapons that allow you to take care of these enemies in much more powerful and kind of like impressive ways. That's when the VFX and the sound effects all come together and give you this combat bang that we all like and love. Okay, so now let's take a little... All right, so before we leave combat, right? I'll say this. That trailer made this look a lot more dynamic, a lot more fluid than what this looks like. I'll, I'll say that like a medium. However, the game does look good. It just don't look as good as it looked in the announcement trailer. Now, the second thing being said, right? I'm probably covering like the R2 meter over here. You can see the R2 meter over there, right? Where it's showcasing a different la layer of drone skills from the looks of it. But it looks like you can map whatever to either side. What I will say is the combat does remind me of two human, but it also reminds me of another game. And I hope I don't get flack for this. It reminds me of The Surge. I don't know how many people played that game. I personally think it's an amazing game, but I think it's the issue is with developers immediately, like at least this year, for some strange reason, they've been coming out and immediately saying, oh, our game isn't the souls like or anything like that. And this very much couldn't be, it, it, it's more than likely not going to be a souls like. I did see like the manual save when he was exploring and he went down to earn his hut and all that. It looks, it looks more like a action RPG, so to speak. It's, I think it's the camera angle that they decide on because they're always trying to keep the camera angle in tight. That's the other thing too. I hope I can take those numbers off the screen. Just as a personal preference. I don't, you don't have to do it. But I just, I wish that would be an option because when I'm playing and I see those numbers, because Monster Hunter, I don't like numbers on the screen because I used to play the old school Monster Hunters three, three, oh, or try, uh, three U, four U, Generations, Gen U, Double Cross. I played, all of those didn't really have numbers on the screen. And so it kept you kind of like in a fight moving. And it's like, when I see numbers, I immediately think MMOs or back to my World of Warcraft days, Final Fantasy 14 days and all that. And I'm just thinking to myself like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just playing the game. I'm kind of clickety clankety, clinkety clankety. And it don't, <laughs> it don't, it don't really feel good from a, from a game feel standpoint, so to speak for MMOs, it works, but for like single player games, it don't work for me. And I, I've never been able to understand it fully. It, it's just more of a psychological thing with me. And it just completely takes me out. Like it rips me out the game. And I just feel like uh, I'm just sitting here playing something and I'm just crunching numbers for the most part. And, and in all games, don't get me wrong. You are crunching numbers. I just don't want to visually see it, if that makes sense. Bang that we all like and love. Okay, so now let's take a little pause from the combat and let's go back to the investigation and the exploration. Actually, I did the same thing in Black Myth Wukong now that I'm thinking too, because I, I remember that you could turn on the numbers so you could see how much damage you was doing. I was like, get this, get, get this on my game, man. Get this on my face. I want to see this. So, like I said, there's no again pattering. There's no Again, make it an option. Don't take it completely out the game. Make it an option because there are those that like that. I'm just on the other side. <laughs> so let it be an option, please. One of these kind of like fly by wire, it's up to you to figure out what your kicker is. What I mean by kicker is what you're supposed to achieve. I do like that, the hood though. The hood looks kind of nice. Like you're on the iPad, kind of like, kind of like a pip boy off of a uh, fallout a little bit, but this looks, this look kind of cool though. Investigation, loadout, inventory, drone, exploration. I don't know what exploration would be. Would that be, well, they said no map. So why have an exploration tab? Say no map, no guide points, no check marks or anything like that. So why have an exploration? It's up to you to figure out what your kicker is. What I mean by kicker is what you're supposed to achieve at this specific moment, what you're actually looking for where to look for it and how to look for it, right? Remy and the players are at a ratio of information, which is one one. It's in Akasa Marshes. It's quite a ways from here. 
So one of the tools that we're providing you to still kind of help you a bit and manage this one-on-one kind of like knowledge ratio is your data pad. Think of it as a bit your investigation wall, if you want, but in a digital 90s format. So your clues, your leads, the important people that are related to your investigation, trying to find your parents and a lot more eventually are all stored. You cheeky bugger. You cheeky, cheeky bugger. I, I I knew you wasn't gonna go like you wasn't going full selling. You weren't gonna go like all in on the Nah figure it out, buddy. Because I was about to say there are very few games that have full sailed it and required the player to remember certain things. I'm looking at you, System Shock. You was one of the best games I played last year. I think you was my game of the year last year. There are very few games that will full send, that will full send you on yo, you know nothing. We ain't giving you nothing, we ain't telling you nothing. Well, no, we'll tell you everything, but you got to remember all this information. You can write it down if you want to. We don't care. We just not going to write it down for you, sucker. There are games out there that are few and far in between that I like that. And this one, I thought it was going to go into that system shock bag with it. It's not. It's not. I, I could pull it back. It's, it's like a tier below system shock. You ain't there. You tried to be, but you ain't there stored here, they were linked together by the relationships, and now it's up to you to go and investigate about them. So as you can see here, some of the areas can be quite wide open. Oh, this one guacamole. here, the Casa Marshes, is one of the bigger ones, and as I spoke quite a bit already, the game doesn't hold your hand or doesn't really tell you where to go. So out of your main leads or clues or ideas that you have in your head of what you're supposed to do or where you're supposed to go at any given moment, you will also be attracted by a lot of points of interest or just little things in the environment that pique your curiosity. And as you walk towards them or explore, that's when you'll start also making a ton of like peripheral or side discoveries on your own, things that you cannot solve right away or things that you might think that there is a thing to be done with it when there's none and it's all part of the fun stuff and the kind of like experience that we're providing in the game so as you can see here there's a tree with people that have been hung uh, like i said this takes place during a very vicious civil war between two different ethnicities in the countries that are still basically the exact mm -hmm. same people and you found this the tree it's actually oh, not part the of the golden path or not part of something tremendously important in the game but there's still something around it. There's still something to be found. And it's probably linked to more stuff that you can do in relation to it. But that you had to do your own exploration to find it. And even more of your own exploration and investigation to figure out what it's linked to and what you can do from it, if you want. Okay. Sound good. So here we are in a dungeon in the game. So yes, the game has dungeons. This was really important to us. Like I said at the beginning, there's a bit of a love letter to games from the 90s. But one of the challenges was the game takes place in a contemporary setting. The game takes place in 1993. And yet we still wanted dungeons in the game. And I didn't want the dungeons to take place in an abandoned metro station or you know, in an abandoned factory because it's the modern era. I still wanted the dungeons to be very ancient things. And this brings us to another really important aspect of the game or one of the very important well, I think one of the major things that I'm trying to figure out is where exactly do the game take place? Not necessarily a time and setting. You said Hadea, I think was the name of the area that where the person was born, then they got moved to Canada and then they came back. So if they came back to Hadea, where, where is Hadea on a world map? Like, so to speak. So like, is it set in France? Is it set in Italy? Is it set in Germany? Like where at? Because I, I know that ain't the United States. At least I think. But where, whatever. Where, where is it set is, is my main question. Important themes of the game, which is history, historicity, deep history. So history that goes even before history. So there's a lot of mysteries and a lot of lore and the origin of what's going on in the country and the link to the Civil War is all tied There's to the deep point history right there. and also what has happened since. I won't get into too much details because that will be part of another video for you guys, but you can see a bit of it here and it shows you the varied palettes and moods and atmospheres that we have in the game, which also I think is something quite interesting and unique that we're doing in Hell Is Us. I do think this game gives me mad two human vibes 
I'm hoping Thanks a lot. that it's Thanks for being more with of a success us. I hope than you enjoyed it. Though. I'm extremely grateful to have you guys following us, the team as well. So just to repeat, The Game Hell Is Us will be released in 2025 as Box Series, PlayStation 5, and PC. And there's a lot more coming soon about the game. This is just the beginning. We'll explain other aspects of it and get into sometimes a bit of the minutia. So stay tuned and speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, good sir. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to make sure I stay up with all of that. I'm, I'm interested. My curiosity has peaked. I wish listed on PS5. So here is what I do want to say, right? Oh, before I do that thing, Hell is Us gives me a ton of different vibes from a ton of different games, right? But more importantly, it gives me a two human vibe, which I don't know how many of you know about that game, but Two Human was a game that came out on Xbox 360. It had a horrible development cycle. I'll, I'll just put that out there. Uh, the game came out very buggy, but what we got, you could really see the potential as to what it could have been. And I think the the crazy thing about it is that that what it could have, what it could have, should have, like portion of it, kind of during that time made people want another one just to see what that particular studio could make if that makes sense and right here that's the feeling that i'm getting we're getting what two human could have been if that makes sense i'm really looking forward to this game i can't necessarily figure out exactly what aspect of the game is sticking out to me more i want to say the combat but i gotta see more of it as he said that it can advance and become more robust with bigger actions and the visual effects as well as the audio effects will come in, uh, come together to create an interesting combination i don't really know what he means by that because to me that sound like word salad whereas you could have just showed the player like an example of those different abilities coming together so that we could see how interesting it looks for ourselves as opposed to you telling us you know what i mean because this is supposed to be a studio that is working on a game that is all about show over tell it's kind of odd that you didn't show in that point that's just to me that's just something that i'm i'm pointing out now whereas for everything else I'm excited. I want to see more of this game. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep up to date with it. Whenever they release something for it, we're gonna come here, sit down right here in our little corner of YouTube, and we're gonna talk about it. I think the story so far seems pretty interesting. I like the backstory of the main character, whereas over time he developed psychological trauma in the form of abandonment, which I think will happen to any kid. It happened to me when I was a kid, when my, my brothers and sisters dipped out on me, even though it was only for a little bit of time, I felt abandoned for that period of time. So now as for the enemy variations, we only really seen four, which I think is enough because they said that it was alpha footage. But the thing that's really hitting me right now is that they said that the game, what they showcased was alpha footage, right? Which is probably just something that they had prepared to be able to actually show. Whereas their current build, where they currently are in their development cycle, they probably just don't have a build for it. Because just a little bit of, I guess, elaboration on development cycles. If you're in your alpha a year before the game comes out, you're strapped for time at that point. You know what I mean? Because an alpha is like the very beginning of production. And even though production cycles for software or production life cycles for software is fast, but all in all, I'm really looking forward to the game. If you all are too, let me know in the comment section down below. If you'd like to see more, please be sure to subscribe to the channel. And yeah, I'll catch you all later. Y'all take care of yourselves. Deuces.